Good morning, everybody. I have a question for you as we get started today's message. How do you love God back? Have you ever asked this question? How do you honor God as your God? Now, if you're not a Christian here, you may be thinking, why would I ask that question? But if you were here last week and if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you know the answer to why we would ask that question. The answer is it's because of God's amazing grace. When you think of God's love for you, how he gave his one and only son for you, that the Lord Jesus voluntarily gave up his glory and his honor, became one of us, suffered and died for our sin, was buried and then raised from the dead on our behalf. When you think of how God has provided for you and protected you and directed you and comforted you, all the gifts that God has given, all the grace that God has given, when you think of the way that God has broken the power of sin in your life, old chains and old forms of slavery that you couldn't break free. I mean, that's my story. I was in a, a pit that I had dug through my addiction to drugs and alcohol and all sorts of trouble that I got into, and I couldn't get out. And God reached down and he pulled me out because of his love and his mercy. When you know the character of our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, your heart should overflow and say, what can I do? What can I give? How can I respond to this amazing grace of God? And that brings us to the question, how do I love God back? How do I honor God as God? And that's really why we're doing this series. Because we want you as Christians, those of you who are followers of Christ, we want you to know how you can direct your desire, your zeal, your love, uh, your, your, your desire to respond to God, to direct it toward him in a way that really truly pleases and honors him. Because we live in a kind of selfie age where men worship themselves. They worship the God of self, selfie. And when you worship selfie like uh, Americans do, it's kind of the spirit of the age, then you do what you want, when you want, how you want, with whoever you want, for as long as you want. And the only sin, the only rule is nobody can tell you to stop. Everyone must affirm, everyone must approve, everyone must applaud, everyone must tolerate because you and you alone are your own God. And this is the spirit of our age. This is what's being preached from every television station, every Disney Plus show, every Super Bowl halftime show, in the universities, in the major media, in Silicon Valley, at Washington, D.C. Our culture, the American culture, is discipling us as Christians to worship not God, but ourselves. And so when you ask the question, how do I please God? How do I worship God? What can I give God? It's easy to try to define that on your own. Well, I will decide what the word love God means. I'm going to take it like a cup and I'm going to pop off the lid and I'm going to pour out the substance of the word love with God's definition. And I'm going to pour in my own definition of the word love. And that's how I'm going to respond to God. I mean, isn't that what we're doing today? Redefining what it means to be a man and a woman and marriage and everything else? Calling evil good and good evil, light dark and darkness light. Isn't that what Americans do? Aren't they trying to redefine everything? And so it's very easy for you and I as Christians when we feel this gratitude towards God, to want to respond in love, but then to kind of decide for ourselves how we do that. And that's not good. That's not what God wants. That's not worthy of God. But God has given us direction in the scriptures. He's told us how he wants us to honor him, how he wants us to love him back. And the way we do that is by giving him as our God the first and best of the three most precious things in our lives. Because the most precious things in our lives, they are our lives. And when you give someone the most precious thing in your life, that really tells you how much you love this person and is devoted to this person. So when we give God the first and best of the three most precious things in our lives, this is how God tells us we are to love him. This is what he is pleased by. This is what he's honored by. And those three things are our money, our time, and our relationships. We give God the first fruits of all the wealth that we have because it symbolizes all the rest that he has given us. We give God the first and best part of our day in fellowship and intimacy and in prayer, listening to him and speaking with him and directing our whole day towards obeying him. We give him the first part of our week, Sunday, the first day of the week, to worship and to gather with God's people for fellowship and for honoring him because he's due that kind of worship. And we love God best when we put his people first, when we love our brothers and sisters in Christ the way Christ loved us. When we do these three things, we are truly worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in this series, we want to show you what it looks like in the hopes that God would ignite your heart and increase your faith so that you would respond to his grace in a way that's pleasing to him so that you could be partakers of this family love. That's what this is. Now, I want to start by describing the 
the giving of our wealth to God in, in terms we don't usually use. We don't usually use words like honor and duty and privilege, but that is exactly what it is for Christians to give their wealth, a portion of their wealth, the first and best of their wealth to their God. It is a privilege to serve the God of all grace. In the scriptures, this is how it is described. These are the people that are honored, brothers and sisters from the past. For example, in the church of Corinth, Paul writes to them, he says, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely out of their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Paul had been receiving gifts from another church. And when they gave these gifts, they were very poor. When they gave these gifts to help Paul proclaim the gospel in a new place, they weren't like, oh, this is such a sacrifice. I don't know how I'm gonna make this work. They were like, please, can we please be a part of this? I mean, God has saved us and transformed us and did so many good things for us. He's restored our marriages and our families and he's, he's, he's given us his joy and power. I mean, how can we repay God? And then there's this opportunity to spread this good news, to spread this hope, to spread the love of God to another place. And they're like, yes, please, let us do it. Let us have this privilege. This is how honoring God with our money is described in the scriptures. We talked to my community group last week about putting others first in relationships and some of our favorite stories of putting one another first and how we've seen God minister and love us through the body of Christ. And I'm grateful to be a part of Church in the Valley, which really practices what we're going to be looking at during the third week, which is loving God best by putting his people first. We, we've really done that. We've really loved one another and poured ourselves out for one another in this church. And we have great stories of that. It's a wonderful thing. And so we want to excel in all three of these things. And why? Why? Why do we give God the first and the best? Because it is a way of saying that I dedicate my whole life to him. And that's what God wants. He wants us to give him his whole life. And you know this. If you've been a Christian for a little while, if you just think about it rationally, of course, the God of the universe who gave everything to us by becoming one of us, Jesus Christ, by suffering and being lonely and hungry and poor and being beaten and broken and hung on a cross for us, he gave everything for us. Of course, when, when he looks at us and says, will you receive my grace? Will you enter into a relationship with me? Will you love me back? Will you respond? And we say, how? And he says, give me everything as I have given you everything. Of course, that's what God wants. That makes sense. Of course, that makes sense. What kind of God would want all of you? What kind of husband doesn't want all of his wife? What kind of wife doesn't want all of his husband? Who wants something to be held back? Of course not. And so in the scriptures, you see this is the kind of worship God desires. In Romans 12, 1, it says, Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Your whole life. Here in the scriptures, in 1 Corinthians 10, it says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do part of it for the glory of God. Do some of it for the glory of God. Do it all for the glory of God. It's why in the scriptures you see God saying, give me your whole body. Give me all of your thoughts. Give me all of your relationships. If you read those passages that are cited in the message, you'll find that God says, honor me with your whole body. Take every thought captive and make sure it's true and right and good and pure and excellent. Make your mind cleansed by the word of God. Think purely. That's what God wants. Your whole mind, your whole body, your whole life. And as you worship Christ, you do this by dedicating your whole life to him. This is what the Lord did for us. He gave us everything. Again, to the Corinthians, Paul writes, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You remember what he did? Though he was rich and exalted, the king of kings, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. He was rich, but he became poor, so that you who are poor could become rich. Think about the Lord. In his ministry, he was poor and he was homeless and he was hungry. Why? Why was that? He was poor so that you become rich. He was hungry so that you could be full. full. He, was, he was naked so that you could be clothed in his righteousness. He was homeless so that you could be brought home, homecoming. And on the cross, he was broken and beaten and alone. And why was he alone? On your behalf rather than you being forsaken by God and cast into eternal fire, separated from God forever, the Lord Jesus took upon himself the turning of the back of the Father, his relationship with God broken. He was alone so that you would never be alone again. He was broken so that you could be healed. 
He was, he was humiliated so that you could be exalted and restored to the image of God, the, the glory that God made man to have. God is transforming you from one degree of glory to another. And that's all because of what Christ did for you. And so when Paul and the apostles talk about honoring God with the first and the best, well, of course, it's only right for such a great God as Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, the way we do this with our time and our money and in our relationships is specific. God prescribes it for us. He explains it to us. Now, when it comes to honoring God with our money, we give him the first and best in faith and gratitude. Here's an interesting comment by a man named Sal Strand. He's a theologian who's written some very helpful books in the 50s about the tithe. And he points out something interesting about time and money and why these two in particular are so important to God and so important to us. It's very insightful. Listen to what he says. He says, time is that continual grant that God gives, which is almost synonymous with life itself. Now, property is that part of God's material good, which is proper to a given individual. Thus, time and property, they sum up pretty largely the concerns of life. And as stewards of time and property, we as Christians recognize the sovereignty of God, the rightful rule of God, God's first place in our lives by returning a portion of each to him. We say, you're my king, I worship you, you're my God by returning a portion of our time and a portion of our money to him. This is how we show our reverence and worship. This is our duty as followers of Jesus Christ, and it's also our privilege because of what God has done for us and because of what God does through our tithes and offerings. As we give God the first and best of our money, he uses that to build his kingdom and extend his work. All the good that God has done in your life he wants to continue to do in another life, in another generation, until this entire world is Christian. He wants the kingdom to spread around the globe. He wants every nation. And you are a part of the story of God's people. And what if the church continues to grow for another 10,000 years? You ever thought about that? Church has been around for 2,000 years, but what if the church continues to grow for 10,000 more years? Your life is down at the bottom and your sacrifice and your giving and your faith and your worship will be a part of the story that God uses to grow his kingdom around the planet. What a privilege. What a privilege. This is the way we should think about giving our resources to God. Now, in the scriptures, we see that we are to give the Lord one-tenth of all we produce. Why? because it is symbolic of all the rest that we have. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 explicitly teaches this. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth. That's a really good principle. Obviously, if he's the Lord of your life, you honor him with your wealth, right? And then he specifically tells you what that looks like and with the first fruits of all you produce. So you produce a harvest and you bring in the crops. The first tenth goes to the temple of the Lord. You make a paycheck from the labor of your hands, and the first 10% of gross goes to the Lord Jesus, to the local church that you are a part of. Why? Because this is the place that God has prescribed, this is the place that God has prescribed the giving to go. And then it says, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. God's promising to bless you. He's saying, look, you want your barns to be built? You want your vats, your barrels of wine to be full? You want to be blessed? You want your socks blessed off? You want things overflowing? Then honor me with your money and give me the first fruits. Show me that I'm God. Enter into covenant with me. You are my people when you honor me as your God. And when you enter into this covenant with me and you fulfill your part of the covenant by honoring me as your God with your wealth, with your time, in your relationships, I will be your God. And as your God, I will bless you. This is a promise, and God does not lie. You can trust this promise. And so as you read from the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, what you see is that the tithe, the first 10% of your wealth, of your paycheck, of your property, the first 10% of the increase that God gives you financially is the minimum standard for Christian giving. I'll say that again. The tithe is the minimum standard of Christian giving. From Genesis to Revelation, you find that if you're looking for a standard, man, I just, I'm so grateful to God 
I want to please God. How do I do that? Honor God with the first and best of your life. Great. Well, like, what do you mean specifically? Well, honor him first and best with your time. Honor him first and best in relationships. Honor him first and best with your money. My money, well, what do I do? Well, give God the first fruits of your money. What does that mean? Well, if you look at the scriptures, the standard practice is the first 10%. Okay, that's what I'll do. Why? Because I want to honor him. Why? Because he's my God, because of all that he's done. Because I want to please him, because I love him. I want to respond. You see, this, this is the right posture when it comes to this topic. We don't do this begrudgingly. It's a privilege. It's a duty. And it's an honor. And particularly as men, we want honor. Men don't go into the burning buildings as firemen. And they don't put the shield on and protect people at nighttime as, as police officers because they're, they're looking to get rich. They do this because they want honor, because they want to be a part of something. They want to represent something. They, they, they want their lives dedicated to something. Men are concerned with honor. And there's nothing more honorable or noble than having the Lord Jesus Christ as your God and living your life in such a way that you always acknowledge him and reference him and honor him so that your kids see it and your wife see it and your coworkers see it. And you become a strong pillar in your community because of your faithful love and trust in this God. That is honorable. And a part of that is the way you spend your time. And a part of that is the way you conduct yourself in relationships. And yes, a part of that honor is that you honor God with your money and your children can see it and you teach them to do it and your wife can see it, that you, the husband, trust God in this way. And yeah, it's scary, but it's honorable to do that. And it honors God. We don't talk about the tithe like this very much, but that's the truth. And that is something that resonates in the hearts of men. I will not come before God empty-handed. Empty-handed worship is no worship at all. I will come before God with offerings. I will come before God with the best that I have because of my gratitude to what he's done. And if you are a Christian, this desire should be growing into you. Now, it's not just Christians who should do this. This is true for pagans. What's crazy is what archaeologists have discovered. Archaeologists discovered from cultures from the Aztecs to the Chinese, from the Assyrians to the Egyptians, They've discovered that when you look at the standard religious practices of these ancient civilizations, all of them gave to their gods a tenth, a tithe. It was the universal practice of the ancient pagan world. Some of the interesting things I found in my research on this topic, for example, one of the last kings of Egypt, his name was Amosis. After he defeated his enemies, he gave a tenth of all the slaves and all the cattle and all the precious metals, even fields, towns, and provinces, he gave a tenth of all those things to the temples and the cults of his God. He did this to repair and rebuild those temples so that the name and renown of his God would go out. A tenth of all the spoils. This is also true in Babylon. Josephus, who was a historian around the time of Christ, he wrote that Nebuchadnezzar, after he defeated his enemies, tithed a tenth of all of the spoils of his war to the god Belus and to the other temples of the Babylonian gods. Also in Assyria, one of the kings that we're familiar with, Tiglath-Pilzer, he was a famous king in the scriptures, he consecrated a tenth of the spoils that he received from war to the god Ashur and the god Ramon. And they called this Esra. When you read Assyrian, you find that they give Esra. The people gave Esra, the king gave Esra, they all honored their god with a tenth of the spoils that the God gave to them as a sign of their obedience, as a sign of their dedication and consecration, as a sign of their fear of their God. This was how you honored God in money. Okay? You also see it in Greece. In Greece, Agamemnon, who was famous from the Trojan Wars, you maybe saw the movie Troy with uh, Brad Pitt, but it's, it's from the Iliad, which is a book written by an ancient Greek author named Homer. And the man, the king, Agamemnon, was the great king of kings in Greece, and he conquered the Mycenaeans. And it says that he gave 10% of all the spoils as tribute to his gods. That's the Greeks. In the Rome, Romans history, Romulus, Camillus, who were the founding fathers of Rome, both of them made it standard practice to give to the temple of Hercules, which is one of the oldest gods in Rome, a tenth of all the spoils of war. Archaeologists have found that the farmers in Rome, all the way up to the fourth century, uh, all the way up to the first century um, AD, were giving a tenth of all the first fruits from their farms to the temples of the gods. Why? Why are all these pagans doing this? Because they know that empty-handed worship is no worship at all. They know that you can't claim that 
Ashur and Ramon and, and Ashdod and Baal and Hercules and some other god is your god, but you give him no honor in time, you give him no honor in the way you relate to people, and you give him no honor in your money. Oh yeah, he's my god, but he gets less pl last place or no place in these three areas of my life. That's not worship. And so even the pagans knew how to do it right. And if the pagans know how to worship God this way, how much more should we as God's children? And yes, the tithe is also taught in the scriptures. It's not generosity, but it is our duty and our privilege as the servants of the King of King, Jesus Christ. Read Exodus 22, 29 through 30. Listen to how God describes it. You shall not delay to offer, so don't hold back. As soon as you have those first fruits, bring them to the Lord. You shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest, not the leftovers, not at the end of the month, the fullness of your harvest, and from the overflowing of your presses, the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. You shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. Seven days it shall be with its mother, and on the eighth day you shall give it to me. This is why Jesus was brought to the temple on the eighth day and offered to God as the firstborn son, the firstborn ox, the firstborn sheep, and the first fruits of all of the agricultural produce, the first fruits of their paycheck, it all was given to the Lord, to the temple of the Lord. Why? You give God the first and the best as a way of representing the rest. How else would you honor your God? Now, God doesn't teach us this to guilt us. He doesn't teach us this so that you feel bad. <laughs> this is a get-to, not a have-to. And God wants to grow in you fruit, maturity, faith, virtue. He wants to pour so much blessing you can't handle it. But the problem is, is that oftentimes, because of the corruption in our hearts and our unbelief, we take what he gives us and we spend it off on our passions and sin. And so God is purifying us in the area of money. And God wants us to excel in the area of money. And so Paul writes to the Corinthian church, since you excel in everything, I mean, your faith is great, and your speech is great, and knowledge is great, in your complete and earnest love that we've kindled in you, and all these things you're excelling, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. Giving is a grace. It's an area of our life God wants to grow fruit in. And so when I was growing up as a Christian, when I became a Christian at 19, I had a job at Pizza Hut, didn't make much money, and I learned that I was supposed to tithe, so I started tithing. And I was on a high, man. I was so grateful for what God had done to me and what he'd done for me. I was so grateful, and so when I found out that I needed to be baptized, I didn't know what that was. I told the guy, hey, can we do it right now? He's like, no, it's 9.30 at night. We don't have a baptismal. So I'm off in Joshua Tree at this guy's backyard at the soonest possible moment, Pastor Joey Joseph. He's baptizing me with my family around because that's what God wanted, that's what I want to do. And I find out that God wants me to honor him with his money, and so I'm tithing. But I didn't know it was like the first fruits. I thought it was like I got my paycheck, and I looked at the amount that I got net after taxes and after all that, and then I gave God 10%. But later on, I learned it was the first fruits. The very first person that is honored with the money is God. And so I changed it to gross. And then in my 20s, we didn't have a lot of money. We had way more month than money. But God always provided for us. He always took care of us. And this is the story for all sorts of people. Here at Church in the Valley and beyond, you cannot outgive God. You can trust God. You can honor him with your money. In fact, I heard a story recently of one of the younger members at our church. This person is, you know, young and it's tight financially. And this person decided that they were going to get right on the tithe. They were going to give God the first fruits, the first and best. And they decided they were also going to get right on their taxes. And they were going to do their taxes well. And later on that day, this person received a $3,000 scholarship. Free, free money from the college that they go to. Out of the blue, they get a call and they're informed that they are now gonna get $3,000 for free as a scholarship to pay for school. And this was a huge help. And I promise you, whatever their taxes and whatever their tithe was, it wasn't close to $3,000. And so God was showing this person, look, I can take care of you, you can't outgive me. If you honor me with the first and best of your wealth, I will be your God and I'm gonna take care of you. And that's what this person saw. And that's what you'll see too. But make no mistake, the tithe is the minimum standard of Christian giving. You, th you see this throughout the Bible. Before Moses and the law, some people say, well, that's just the Old Testament. That's just the Old Testament law. No, no, no. Before the Old Testament, people were tithing. 
And in the New Testament, people are tithing. And more importantly, the laws that God gave his people, they don't go away in the New Testament unless Jesus says they go away. We don't sacrifice bulls and goats because Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice. He fulfilled those laws. We don't follow the rules and ordinances of holy days and you know, kosher food and we can't eat pork. That's all done because Jesus said that he has made all food clean. There are things from the Old Testament law that Jesus has completed, fulfilled, or abrogated, gotten rid of. But unless he said this is no longer in effect, we continue to follow it as normative and directional. And that's the tithe. And so here are some examples. You want to see how biblical it is? Cain and Abel, the first sons of Adam and Eve. What do they do? Genesis 4, they bring offerings to the Lord. Why? Because they're honoring him as their God. And of course they honor him with the first fruits. But the problem is, is Cain, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like Cain offered the first fruits. He offered a portion, but not the first fruits. It says that Abel gave God some of the first of the sheep of his flocks. So it looks like Abel was given God the first and best, but Cain was not. You know how that ended. Then there's also Abraham and Melchizedek. Melchizedek is this interesting figure in the Old Testament. He's a priest of God Most High and the king of Salem. So he's this figure that shows up in the life of Abraham, and he's a priest of our God. He, he represents our God, right? And Abraham just went to war and defeated a bunch of evil kings, and he's coming back with the spoils of war. And when he sees this priest of God Most High, you know what Abraham does? He bowed down and he gives 10% of all the spoils of war to this priest. Why? Because this priest represents Abraham's God, Yahweh. And so he offers to Yahweh 10% of the spoils of war as symbolic that all he has is Yahweh's, that Yahweh is his God, that Yahweh gave him victory, and that he trusts Yahweh. This is long before Moses was a glimmer in his daddy's eye. Then you do have Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, and he doesn't want God to be his God. He wants to be his own God. He's pretty sneaky, but he gets into some trouble, and so he finally says, okay, listen up, God. If you'll be my God, and you'll protect me, and you'll watch over me, and you'll give me food, and you'll bring me back home safely, then you, the Lord will be my God. And then he says something interesting. In Genesis 28, 20 through 22, you can read it on your own. He says, you will be my God and I will give you a tenth of everything you give me. You see, the way that he demarcated Yahweh as his God was by giving him a tenth of everything that he received from Yahweh. Jesus himself affirms the practice, the standard of tithing. He criticizes the Pharisees, but not for tithing. He criticizes the Pharisees because they don't do what's even more important than tithing, loving people and dealing with people justly. He affirms and upholds the tithing. Keep tithing, that's good, but you should also love and practice justice. This is even more important to God than tithing. And so you see in Luke eleven forty two, 42, Jesus says, woe to the Pharisees, because you give a tenth of your mint, rue, and all the other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter, justice and love, without leaving the former undone, tithing from your spice rack. Look, you're so fastidious, you're so focused on being honoring of God, even in the spice racks, that's good, keep that up. But why are you neglecting love and justice? Because that's even more important to God. Christ does not nullify, he does not repeal tithing, but he affirms it. And in the New Testament, this is normal. In the New Testament, this is just how it was. The apostles assumed the practice of tithing, and they, they assumed the practice of offerings. And the reason why was because, <coughs> was because, excuse me, the reason why was because the tithes and the offerings were used three ways. To financially pay spiritual leaders, to help those in need, and to send money elsewhere to people who had needs. So, for example, Paul and the apostles assume and teach that it's right for ministers of the gospel, pastors and teachers who give their full-time work to building up the church and proclaiming the gospel and teaching the word of God and ministering to God's people, it's right for them to make an income from that. And so in 1 Corinthians 9, 13 through 14, Paul compares the old Levitical system of the temple and the priests and the Levites who got the tithes from those people. He compares them to the pastors and teachers and, and proclaimers of the gospel in the New Testament. And he says that in the same way that they received the tithes as a way of providing for them then, in the same way, the offerings of the saints in the New Testament is going to provide for spiritual leaders today. He says, don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? And that those who serve at the altar share in what, the offer, what is offered at the altar? In the same way, 
the Lord has commanded. In the same way, just like then is true for now, in the same way the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Those who preach it should receive it from the gospel. Those who work should also eat. And so financially paying spiritual leaders with the tithe is biblically commanded. Then there's number B, there's letter B, which is to help those in need. Now beyond the tithe is just the generous offering to those in need. And so you find the Corinthian church is being told about this other church. And in verse four, as we read before, it says, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service of the Lord's people. They wanted to give and they exceeded our expectation. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. Now my understanding of this verse, and I could be wrong, but my understanding is they dedicated themselves financially to the Lord. They gave the Lord the first and best. And then they also gave money to Paul and the apostles who were with him to help the churches that were in need. So there's the tithing and the offering. And then in Philippians, you see that they sent money in other places. So, so in the New Testament, you find Christ, you find the apostles assuming this practice of tithing and offering. And there are some interesting things to think about when you're considering doing this for the first time, because I remember doing it for the first time. First of all, there are promises that God makes to those who honor him with the first and best of their money. Because you may be thinking, I don't make a lot of money, and I don't know that I can do this. This is, I don't know if I can, I can honor God in this way. I mean, I see it, I understand. I mean, it makes sense to me that if he's my God, I'm gonna give him first and best in my money. It's just, it's hard, you know? I've been, I've been living off of that. What do I do? Well, here's a promise that God has made. For those who honor him with the first and best of their money, he promises to meet all of your needs. It says that in Philippians 4, 19, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. This is a promise from God. Do you believe what God is saying? Is God a liar? He will take care of you. I have seen this in my life. I have seen this in other people's lives. In fact, I have a testimony I'd like to share with you from Ryan Eaton about when he was first becoming a Christian and he was first learning how to tithe, how God taught him that if he trusted and honored God with the first and best of his money, that God would take care of him and provide for all of his needs. Listen to this testimony. When we were new to CIV, I gave sporadically and I was challenged to give a regular tithe we came up with a percentage that we wanted to begin tithing regularly. When I did the bills, if we tithe the percentage that I wanted to give, it left us with $20 for the week for a family of four, which would be really hard to get through. We prayed about it. Malachi 3.10 came to mind where God says that we can really test him in this. So we prayed and we gave the percentage that we had committed to. And then we tried to figure out how we were gonna get through the week. We started lining up dinners with grandparents and, and figured out what we needed to do. The very, at the time, we owned a balloon decorating company. And the very next day, we got a phone call for a new job. And they came through with a deposit that same day. So we tested God, and he really came through and got us. So we were able to get through that week. And he continues to come through for us as, we, as we've faithfully tithed. That's a fantastic story. And you can see in that story that God, you can't outgive him. That Ryan, what he did was he trusted God even though it didn't make sense and God provided for him, showing him that he can truly honor God in this way and that God will take personal responsibility to provide. Do you want God to take personal responsibility for you? You want God to bless you financially to provide for your needs? Then you enter covenant with him by accepting his son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior and by honoring him in every area of your life. And as you honor God in different areas of your life, you receive the blessing of God in those areas of your life. There's also something else to keep in mind, and that is God will call off the devourer. In Malachi 3, 7 through 12, but particularly verse 11, it says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Do you have a hole in your pocket? Do you have a hole in your wallet? Do you find yourself making money, but you can't seem to keep it? It just keeps going out, things are breaking. It doesn't seem like you're making enough to put into this thing as the money that's coming out. Do you have a hole in your pocket? Is the increase that you're producing getting blown away? This is the devourer. And he is unleashed on God's people as a form of discipline, correction, loving correction, but correction so that we will learn to turn and trust and honor God and give him his rightful place, first place in our finances. But the inverse is true. 
Here it says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. In other words, I'm gonna protect your stuff. I'm gonna provide for your needs. I'm gonna protect your things. If you honor me with your money, I'm gonna provide for your needs. I'm gonna protect your things. Now you may think, well, wait a minute. What about this and what about that? But I promise you, God is saying this here. This is God's word. That if you take your life from the beginning, when you start trusting him all the way to the end, and you get to the end and you look back, you will not conclude that you've been ripped off. You will say, God kept his promise. He was good to me. And I am grateful that I have trusted and walked with him in that way. These are promises that you can stand on. Now, as a wrap up, you might be thinking to yourself, why is this such a big deal? Why are we going to talk about money? <laughs> because money is revealing whether or not you're worshiping God or you're worshiping someone else. Whether God is a means to an end, like a genie that you try to please to get good things from, or if honoring God in gratitude is the ends of your life. Money is the great acid test of the heart. Money is the great acid test of the heart. If you know how a man deals with money, how he gets it, how he spends it and keeps it, how he shares it, you know one of the most important things about that person. And as Jesus said in Matthew 6, 23, no one can serve two masters. Either he will love the one and despise the other, or he'll be devoted to the one. Uh, otherwise, he'll despise the one and be devoted to the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so money reveals who we truly worship and honor, who our true God is. And so what we see from the scriptures and what I hope that you are walking away with is that giving God the first and best is a get to. It's not a have to. It's a privilege to serve God and be used by him to bring glory and praise to Jesus Christ. That's what Church in the Valley is. This church is about glorifying Jesus, proclaiming the good news that he is the risen king and the savior of the human race, that he can save anybody and teaching everybody to obey everything he's commanded and learning how to live together in a community, a life-changing community. And if you've been blessed by Church in the Valley, if you've experienced this, it is because of what God has built here. And he's built it through the faithfulness and the faith of previous generations. In many ways, even though we're 35 years in at CIV, I feel like we're just getting started. God has blessed our church. We punch above our weight. Our impact in both our church, our area, and then beyond with the churches in our network is far bigger than we could ever hope to accomplish. We're in a new area, Ontario Ranch, one of the biggest residential areas in California history. It's still being built. We're in a prime location. We have strong families. We have a strong culture. God is pouring out his grace in our lives. And yeah, we have our troubles, but God is growing us through them. We have what the world needs. And we have the privilege as Christians of being a part of that. And we, in part, sow what will be reaped by other generations in the future. Sorry, I spit right there. We sow what's going to be reaped by other generations in the future through giving God the first in our money by giving God the first in our relationships and by giving God the first with our time. These things in faith are the seeds that God uses to grow another generation of Christians and expand the kingdom in our area. This is our privilege. This is our honor. This is our duty. And it is not burdensome. So my question to you as I wrap up is this. Will you honor God with the first and best of your money this year? I want to encourage you, if you're not a Christian, to receive Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. You may be thinking, how can I know that God is truly God? Well, I'll tell you something that I heard from a pastor in our church network. He's a pastor at a church in the Huntington Beach area. He was a, um, after church, an atheist came up to him who had been coming to church for a while with his wife. And the atheist said, Pastor Bevan, I don't believe in God. I don't think there's any evidence. How can I know that God is real? Pastor Bevan said, well, I'll tell you, but you're not going to like it. In the Bible, there's one and one only example where God says, test me. Go ahead and test me. And that is with the tithe. In Malachi, God says, test me, bring in the full tithe, honor me with the first and best of your wealth, and you'll see me bless your socks off. I'll pour out so much blessing, you won't have room to store it up. That's what it says in Malachi chapter 3. And so Bevan told this guy, if you want to know God is real, start tithing. Now, he didn't think that guy was going to do it because he was an atheist, and why would he tithe? But apparently he did. And several months later, he came back. He said, Bevan, you're not going to believe this, but it worked. And I believe in Christ. And he was converted <laughs> through this very unusual test. But how did he know that God was real? Because he honored God with his money. 
And so if you have not yet received Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to do that today. And if you want to test God, truly test God, start tithing. Number two, this is a hard teaching for some because of so much of the way we think about money. I've tried to give you an understanding biblically of how this grows out of gratitude and how it's an honor. And yes, it's a duty, but it's a good duty. And, and it's a wonderful thing. And it's the minimum standard. And I hope you see that. I hope you have conviction about that. But you've got to sit down and you've got to have a clear conscience. You've got to do this cheerfully and freely. God is not interested in coercing you. And neither am I. And you're not going to be excommunicated if you don't tithe. And nobody's going to come knock on your door. Okay? But if, with a clear conscience, you have to work through this. So I would encourage you to list and discuss with your spouse, if you're married, or a friend, if you're not, what it would cost to honor God with the first and best in your money. Chances are you're going to have to say no to some things. If you honor God in this way, you're going to have to say no to some things because you're spending the 10% on something else. So you're obviously not going to be able to spend it on that thing, which means there's going to be a reduction somewhere. But that's so that you can honor God with the 10% and he'll bless your 90. He can turn your 90 into a 180 and your 180 into 360. So as you count the cost, you should write out what it's going to cost you to honor God with your money. Do that. And then pray that God would give you the faith to take another step in your finances. If you are tithing, if you're giving God the first and best of your money, wonderful. Keep going. Continue to give even more above that to the needs of others in this church, to ministries beyond Church in the Valley. Increase the amount of money you give in your tithe. Keep going. Keep pushing it. I heard a story about Pastor Harold Bullock from Hope Church. He, he read that verse in Malachi and he decided he was going to increase his tithe from 10 to 11 to 12. And I don't know what number he got up to, but he got up to some number that was ridiculous. And he kept track of all the money that came into his family over three years. And when you counted up the assets he got, free gifts he got, vacations he got, when you added up all the financial value of the things that he got while he was increasing his tithe beyond the 10%, it was more than the increase of the tithe. You can't outgive God. And so I want to encourage you to consider doing that too. You have to be convinced of this in your own mind with a clear conscience that is, this is a biblical thing. At Church in the Valley, Matt is not your guide. Randy is not your guide. Thad is not your guide. The Bible is your guide. And yes, as pastors, we want to be faithful in teaching the Bible and what it means. But I hope today you can see that this is biblical and it is right and good. And if you have seen from the scriptures that this is right, then I encourage you to respond in faith this year. Remember what Paul says in Philippians 4.19, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You can say he is my God when you honor him with the first and best of your wealth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words, the truth, the scripture. We thank you for the provision you've made for us, your son who gave up everything. He paid the ultimate price so that we could be redeemed from our slavery to Satan, sin, and death. And you've adopted us and loved us. You've poured out good things in our lives. You're protecting us. You're, you're a good father caring for us. And Lord, we ask that you would create in our hearts the faith and gratitude to honor you with the first and best of our money. Please apply the words that were spoken today and the truth of what was spoken today to the lives of each person who hears it in the way that's needed. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.